Ennis, welcome to the Building and Growing podcast. We're delighted to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I've been loving your 4K videos on LinkedIn. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad someone notices the, uh, the quality of it. <laughs> yeah, they were really good. Yeah. Excellent. Well, look, hopefully today we're going to do a fantastic one. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we will. So Ennis Huli is from 500 Emerging Europe, um, and we're filming in Istanbul today. Um, welcome again. Would you like to start off by telling us a bit about yourself and your background? Sure, sure. Um, I was born and raised in Izmir, which is a bit southern of Istanbul um, here in Turkey. Um, I went to high school there, then went to Canada for my um, in college years. It was too cold, negative 25 de- degrees. Far out. You can like feel your fucking um, nose basically freezing. That's yeah. how I got into the startup world. I was so bored during winters that I was trying to, st- trying to see what my friends are doing in the US, what's happening, etc. Yes. 2010, 2011, I learned about the startup world. Fantastic. That's how I first got into it, um, tried to build my own company failed miserably at it, we were only able to raise a pre-seed round, okay. came back to Turkey, did angel investing, turned it into an angel network, and then um, started 500 Emerging Europe. Far out. What a story, yeah. Ah. <laughs> it's like, I, I couldn't even become an entrepreneur, I think. It's not like I was at, like, T equals zero, I was at the first step, I couldn't even get to the second step, oh, and looking back, right. I knew nothing. Basically. Yeah. What were you trying to build? It was a marketing tech software, so back then... Facebook started monetization like two years before we started um, Good Buzz. Okay. And what Facebook was doing was, was a lot, what, a, what a lot of the platforms were doing is they were trying to build a parallel network on top of Facebook, which is much more native sharing, but you can also make money sharing it with your own closed network. So okay. we had this um, widget that's embedded onto websites. And if you're trying to promote something, you can create a campaign and say like, hey, um, whoever brings the most leads, for example, yes. would get a signed book yes. or whatever the um, whatever the carrot at the end uh, would be. Marketing platform built on top of Facebook. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, they say if you don't succeed, you learn. And uh, I'm sure yeah. you've been able to bring some of those learnings to the portfolio. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So look, I mean, you know, from, from the beaches of Izmir to the cold of Canada uh, and back to Istanbul, um, uh, that sounds like a fantastic story. So do you want to tell us a bit more about 500 emerging and uh, you know we touched upon the sort of rebrand before let's go back to the start when sure. you founded it here yeah let's go back to 500 istanbul that's yes. what it was called back then um while i was doing angel investing and then while i was building the angel network um called first seed the basic premise the idea was that a lot of the entrepreneurs want to think global from day one mm. much like what they're or how they do it in israel or estonia yes. but to be able to facilitate that you need to send them to the accelerators in the u.s so our main um, value proposition as an angel network was that we're going to give you your first 10K, 20K, really small amounts, yeah. but then we're going to support you go to YC Techstars 500. Mm-hmm. That's how I got in touch with 500 at the first place. They came to Istanbul for an event um, end of 2015, yes. met with the founders here, and they back then they were expanding regionally. So okay. they were launching 500 Southeast Asia, 500 Japan, Korea, Mexico, Mina, etc. Yes. And they had an appetite for Turkey as well. I think that's why they were here. The whole team was here. Wow. And wow. Turkey was booming. I mean, um, it's still booming from a startup startup's per- perspective. It was also booming back then. Yes. So we convinced them to open a branch here in Istanbul called 500 Istanbul. And the um, thesis of the fund was to invest into entrepreneurs who are thinking global from day one. Yeah. They don't want to. Ha- they don't want to have um, anything to do with the local market. They just want to employ talent here yes. while building businesses for the. Um, higher techno, more mature technology markets out in the West, mostly in the US and then somewhat in Europe. Okay. Um, that's how we came to build Five Fund Istanbul in 2016. Um, summer of 2016, we raised a $10 million fund. Nice. Again, doing very small tickets, 100K to 200K to entrepreneurs who are willing to take that extra mile and move to the US and then hopefully go big in the US. Okay, fantastic. So you started off, you know, with first seed doing 10 to 20K um, uh, tickets. And then when 500 Istanbul opened, the focus was 100 to 500K tickets. 100 to 200. 100 to 200K. Okay, fantastic. Pretty, pretty small tickets. And it was also coinciding with 500 Startups' strategy. Yes. Uh, 500 Startups started as as an accelerator in 2010 um, in in the Bay Area. But then they also start, became a VC fund. So while they're running a program, they would also do direct investments, mm. really small tickets, a lot of, int- a lot of uh, investments. So a fund would have somewhere between 50 to 200 investments in a portfolio, wow. which is a very, very large portfolio model. And you can only do that if you're doing small enough tickets, basically. And yeah. we tried to replicate that um, here in Turkey with a little twist where we weren't investing into the local market, but we're investing into local market entrepreneurs who are hoping to build 
global businesses. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. And look, when you were talking about 500's um, geographical reach, you mentioned quite a few markets which are, are emerging markets. Yeah. Um, so is it safe to say that there's an overweight focus on emerging markets? Uh, for sure, for sure. And I think, um, first of all, what makes us different as 500 Emerging Europe is if you're investing into LATAM, yes. if you're investing into Southeast Asia, China, India, Africa, doesn't matter, the emerging market investment thesis is that you believe in a category and mm. it's a proven business model out in the West and you think that this particular entrepreneur can execute it in Africa and become a pan-African unicorn, pan-MENA unicorn. And there are a bunch of unicorns that start in Dubai, grow in Saudi, Egypt, etc. to become a unicorn. Yeah. We're not a region like that. Um, Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe and Turkey, you wouldn't see a success story going from Turkey to Bulgaria, Greece, Romania to become a unicorn or vice versa. Yeah. It doesn't happen because these are 20 cultures, 20 languages. None of them are that big in and yes. of itself. Yeah. So the success story from this region is different than the ones in Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latam, MENA, etc. Yes. It needs a different thesis. So um, going back to your question, I think the emerging market thesis is too much driven on making sure that you invest into the best entrepreneurs in the region mm. and proven business models that are executed locally, um, that are localized for the dynamics of that region or, or the, of the local market. Yes. And then you have you start seeing um, Uber is successful in the US, you see Uber in China, Uber in Southeast Asia, etc. You can't do that in Turkey or Eastern Europe. Yes, okay, okay. And so when it comes to, let's say, some of the challenges that you know, you and the team might find in emerging markets. Are you able to talk about them a little bit? Sure. So, like, I think, like, again, what's different is in African investment thesis, MENA investment thesis, yes. you want to make sure you bet on the best entrepreneurs in that region, period. Mm -hmm. Different than what we're doing here, because here we're betting on this local talent to be successful globally. Globally. And yeah. most of the case in the U.S. So from a value chain perspective, sure, the talent is based here in Istanbul or in Bucharest, but yes. the revenue comes from the U.S., financing comes from the U.S., down the line, M&A, IPO happens in the U.S. So from a value chain perspective, you're only betting on the local talent here and yes. that's hedging everything else about the market, whereas from a U.S. value chain perspective, you're betting on everything that's in the U.S. except for the talent piece, okay. where you're hedging okay. against that and taking a bet on Romanian talent, Bulgarian talent, Turkish talent. Yes. So what what biggest challenge is, we're not trying to find the best entrepreneurs in the region, we're mm. trying to find the best entrepreneurs in the world who happen to be either from the region or in the region. Yes. Which kind of, which make, which creates this biggest challenge around access to talent and access to the best entrepreneurs. Yeah. Because now you have to make sure that you invest to the best of the best and you cannot have a very large portfolio of 100 or 200 companies because when you're betting on Romanian founders, Polish founders, Turkish founders who can become build unicorns in the US, mm. obviously your pool shrinks drastically. Indeed, indeed. And I, I guess I'm gonna, gonna dive into that in a moment, um, but just wanna summarize the fact that, you know, the, the two different theses that exist. One is betting on the best talent in emerging markets who can build successful businesses in the US, as opposed to betting on entrepreneurs who are best in the region that can, let's say, overcome um, some local challenges like currency and, and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, very dynamic markets. Yeah, and let's call this the Israeli model, the first bucket, which is also what we're doing. Yes. We tried to um, coin a term for this and we said, hey, let's call this the emerging talent thesis because you're only betting on the talent in the emerging market and nothing else. Yeah. Whereas in the emerging market thesis, you actually bet on the market. You believe in the Southeast Asian market that's gonna that's been booming for an example not what mm. we're doing not what Israeli entrepreneurs are doing yes. not what Estonian entrepreneurs are doing and when we dive deeper into that we also coined this term called the population paradox where the larger the population gets mm -hmm. the unicorn per capita decreases drastically so yeah. Israel creates much more unicorns than more mid-market countries like um, Spain Italy for indeed, example indeed. Um, and now we have a region of 20 countries that are similar to Israel yes. in a sense that their populations are not big enough, their markets are not big enough, they can't expand regionally, there's nowhere to expand, yeah. so they have to go to the US. So now the question is, can you replicate what Israel did with its six to eight million population across 20 countries, each with similar population? And obviously the opportunity is much, much larger than a usual emerging market thesis when you think like that. Indeed, indeed. That's a fantastic model. Uh, you know, and certainly Israel has had some incredible startups um, that have emerged from there. Um, you know, Hi Bob uh, being one of them that I, I worked with a bit in the past. And yeah, fantastic sort of business models, fantastic talent. 
for sure, for sure. And we see the similar talent in Ukraine, similar talent in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Romania. And this is happening. There are uh, 32 unicorns yes. from Eastern Europe and Turkey. Out of these uh, 32 unicorns, 28 of them are U.S. focused. Mm -hmm. That shows you something. I'm sure there are even more than 30 unicorns in other markets like Latin America yeah. or Southeast Asia. But then how many of them are born in the U.S.? Yes. Not many. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, look, thanks so much for diving into <laughs> that and explaining it for us. I think now, um, you know, let's go back to the point you made about sort of the talent pool itself and drilling down. Um, there was a post recently on LinkedIn which talked about 500 emerging Europe's deal flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think your investment statistic was less than 1% out of all the decks and such that you looked at. Yeah. Are you able to talk us through um, how you source deals um, and, and build up that funnel? Sure. So, like, again, when you position yourself in a way that you're trying to get the best of the best, mm. um, you have to make it outbound. There is no inbound. You can't just expect as an investor that techs are going to come, people are going to apply, and then you try to choose the best. No, it's, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. um, that's how it would work in the public markets. Um, if, if, if this is a spectrum of an access game versus a picking game, yes. in the public market, you have access to every single information, every single stock. You just have to outwin the market with your brains. You have to be smarter and pick the right ones. Yeah. Definitely not what we're doing. What we're doing is much more of an access game where there's an access asymmetry, both on the information level, but mm -hmm. also on the winning the deal level. Yes. And we're spending 99% of our efforts so that we um, have an advantage in this access game. And then the picking the right entrepreneur is easy. Yes. It's easier to identify who has a better shot at creating a global unicorn and who doesn't, as long as you have access to the whole market. The problem is, a lot of the time, since you're trying to go for the best of the best, you don't have access to the best market, best uh, you don't have access to the whole market, especially the best of the best entrepreneurs. Mm. And if you're losing on the top 0.1% of the entrepreneurs, then no matter how well you pick, it's going to be a bad fund. Yes. So if you're fishing from the right pond, for sure you're going to have a good fund. So we're a very, very access-driven um, fund thesis. And that also correlates with the numbers. Because of our full-on outbound effort, yeah. um, our whole team is doing deal sourcing. I think what's different from a culture perspective is that we don't have a we don't have a deal team that's separate than, for example, someone who's doing, doing more financial, who's doing portfolio support. No. Yes. In, in, in yeah. our strategy, everyone does everything, and deal sourcing is everyone's main responsibility. In fact, deal sourcing is the only sole purpose of existence of the company. Yeah. Without deal sourcing, let us not exist. Um, so that's how we looked at 10,000 deals um, right. over the past two years. Out of that 10,000 deals, we did 21 of them. Yes. Um, I think the biggest drop-off, it's like a cliff churn pattern, basically, the biggest drop-off is we screened 10,000 deals. We didn't meet with them. Mm. Out of that 10,000, we met with probably 2,000 of them. Okay. First meeting. Out of that 2,000, second meeting is more like 600, 700. Mm -hmm. Deep dive, where we look into the whole competitive landscape, blah, 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 do this whole analysis paralysis, yes. it's probably more like 200. Oh, and out yeah. of that 200, we did 20 deals. Yeah. Uh, but when you look at the top of the funnel, it's pretty huge because we want to oh, make sure is. that we have access to everything, basically. Indeed, indeed. And so how do you focus on that 0.1% when you're doing the outbound? Uh, when you're doing, the, the problem is a lot of this top 0.1%, mm. you can't even find the um, digital data points or the clues online because the moment they put it on their LinkedIn, they've already raised a couple million. Yes. It's over. Yes. And the chances are they've already raised a couple million from Western VCs. It's not the local VCs that you're competing with. Mm. You're more so competing with Western European, UK or US VCs um, that have a global focus. Yes. And they obviously want to catch these entrepreneurs early on as well. And then that has a lot to do with the brand that you're building. So I think to maximize access, mm -hmm. uh, we had to first turn the whole culture into a deal sourcing culture where that's yeah. everyone's main responsibility. And then the second layer of that is the branding um, play that we do. That yes. includes all these CC Nights events, podcasts, videos, founder dinners, our yeah. team being all over the place, our um, our VP moved to Poland, been spending the past seven months in Poland. Mm -hmm. Our investment manager goes to Baltics every single month, yes. um, et cetera. Cause, so you have to build that geographic presence. We also have a scout network where we give deal by deal carry incentivization. These are mostly ex entrepreneurs themselves. Yes. And we want to incentivize them so that whenever they hear, whenever, some, whenever someone is leaving a company to start its own company, mm. we should know about them, basically, is why we have the scout network. Indeed. We have the entrepreneur LPs. So we have about 22 um, entrepreneurs that mm. also invested into our fund. Yes. So whenever they hear something, we want, the incentives are aligned. We should know about it. Indeed. Um, and then lastly, 
instead of looking at this country by country, we mm. tried to look at this by company by company. Okay. Um, so we tried to map all the companies that raised 10 million plus in Bulgaria, in Greece, in Romania, in Poland, etc. Mm. And then make sure we touch base the top 20 employees yes. of all of those companies. Fantastic. There's not that many. There's like 85 companies, not counting Turkey, because yeah. um, I feel we have good access in Turkey anyways. Indeed. It's Eastern Europe where we lack that access. Mm. Um, we mapped these 85 companies assigned to all of our team members so that yes. they meet with all the C-levels, VPs, head of product, etc. because those are the um, best type of entrepreneurs that if they start, if they turn to be entrepreneurs in a year or two years from now, we should get to know them Indeed. even beforehand. So I think there are a couple of things. There's like a shift left movement, mm -hmm. like in the developer world where we're trying to get access even before they become entrepreneurs. Yes. Um, there's all these mechanisms that we put in place. We even built a two people talent team and okay. all they do is talent mapping. Far we're out. not doing talent mapping for portfolio placements. Sure, that's one of the um, one of the cookies there, but the biggest reason is because those people can become entrepreneurs and we should know about them. Our talent team should know about them Indeed. even before. So all these mechanisms are there so that we maximize access and yes. we don't lose on that 0.1%. Yeah, that's incredible. So it's a, a real multi-channel approach in terms of building up the brand, uh, creating you, you know a community and and doing all of these events, which, you know, I've seen on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. You guys are, you know, bringing in the uh, the, the frequent flyer points and, uh, uh, you know, racking up the, 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 the events uh, uh, fees, uh, I think. Uh, exactly. It, there's always something going on. Um, but I really like the approach in terms of building those relationships with um, people at leading companies because when I look back to um, people that I worked with at Revolut, at Getia, the sort of the alumni or the Revolut Mafia, they called it. There have been a, a huge amount of people who have left and founded companies um, that have raised money from different VCs. And I, I think it's a fantastic approach that you're taking. For sure. I mean, look at the Estonian Mafia, the Skype Mafia, how many companies were founded. I mean, the, the famous example is obviously PayPal, PayPal Mafia. Yeah. But people can be like, hey, that's the US. That doesn't happen in Turkey. It does happen in Turkey. Indeed. There yeah. were more than 80 gaming studios that spun out of peak games. Yeah. A um, couple of which, like Spike, like Dream, etc., raised like tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And that multiplier Indeed. effect, once it kicks in, there's no going back. And it did kick in in Turkey. It did kick in in Romania. It did kick in in Estonia, etc. Yes, fantastic. You've identified all of these different people, um, and then you know you you, you have sort of um, if we go back to your stats, you know you identify ten thousand, um, you screen you know five thousand, five thousand get lost. Maybe you have a first meeting. When you're in that first meeting, second meeting stage, how are you starting to evaluate um, these potential founders and their ideas? Mm -hmm. um, First of all, 80% of the deals that we do are pre-seed. Okay. Meaning it's basically an idea, sometimes a prototype of some sort. Yes. And that's it. Um, th the reason being is that if you wait till post-seed Series A, mm. there's no way you're going to be able to get the best entrepreneurs who are executing in a best fashion. No, it yeah. becomes a global play and you lose to UK, you say US VCs. Mm. So the only way you can get access to that 0.1% of the talent yes. is that you go pre-seed idea stage, you turn this into a proximity game, mm -hmm. and then you win out of proximity because you are based here, you have the brand versus a yeah. um, US fund. So 80% of our deals are pre-seed. There's nothing to evaluate. There are no metrics, no financials, etc. Yes. And our decision-making, um, at least my decision-making personally, is very, very founder-driven. Okay. I only go from zero to one because of the founders. Yes. And then I start looking at the rest. And I look at the rest as more of a red flag review. I never mm -hmm. try to build conviction on the market. I just yes. want to make sure this is not a market where I don't want to touch. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it is. I mean, sometimes I go from zero to one because I, I fell in love with the entrepreneur. I'm pretty sure he or she is going to be successful. But I go look into the market and I'm like, this is not venturable, not deep enough. Um, and then obviously we don't invest. So yes. my decision making is very, very founder driven. All else comes after that. More of a red flag review. I try not to build conviction on nothing else because everything about the business except for the founders, and even sometimes the founders also mm -hmm. changes. I mean, we, we, we want to make sure we invest into the founders who can change everything. They can change it. They can change their go-to-market strategy, product, even their co-founders. I mean, those are even um, changeable. Yes. Should be the um, idea, should be the entrepreneurial characteristic and the hustle that the person has. But that's me personally, and that's why we have an IC, because every uh, other team members might have different approaches, and that's, yeah. that's what makes it healthy. That's why there are different perspectives. Yes. Um, we try to align. But I think founder is the most subjective one mm. um, where 
So everything else about like market, competitive landscape, where it's going, etc. These are all more objective matters. We can argue for hours and then yeah. align eventually. Yeah. And we do spend hours to make sure we align with our, with my GP on all of these ma- matters, except for our perception of the founder. Okay. That, that is subjective. And we should embrace the fact that we can't align there. And if one person is a one, then we do the deal, basically. Okay. Because it's, it's, I mean, obviously, people have different opinions of people see different things as different people. Yes. And what's good for me might not be good for him or vice versa. Mm. And we do want to embrace that fact. Indeed. Fantastic. And you mentioned that, you know, there's this red flag review that you do. Are you able to dive into that a little more? Sure. Um, our, so one of the things that we also did as a team is some companies are much more um, hierarchical hierarchical and vertical yes. so you have the first meeting with analyst you have the second meeting with an analyst you have the third fourth meeting with an associate mm. you've already done eight meetings until you met with a partner for example Indeed. not the case here um, here because we have a much more of a horizontal team mm-hmm. second meeting is always with a GP okay. so no matter where the deal comes from um, our analysts can be sourcing it our investment manager can be sourcing it the second meeting is with always a GP present so that um, me or Arun, we can accelerate things if we're very bullish at the yes. second meeting and after the second meeting we do a deep dive mm-hmm. deep dives are probably 20 to 30 pages um, on average yes. and in this 20 to 30 pages we try to understand how the industry's evolution has been what mm-hmm. the competitors are doing we, we, we read all of the news about all of the competitors so that we get hints yes. we do a couple of expert calls to understand the technology if you're having a big big problem understanding and we do have big problems understanding technology in most of the cases <laughs> so we have the third meeting again with both of the GPs present mm. after we did that deep dive wow. and in that third meeting we have much more um, much more niche and vertical questions about competitors positioning future set etc but yes. all of this process is not to build conviction onto the market, no. It's to qualify the founder's know-how and domain expertise of the market. So yes. for us, this is much more of a um, boxing game where we're learning stuff and we're trying to gauge whether the founder has already thought about this, has a clear narrative, yes. um, whether the founder, he or she, is flexible enough to mold his or her ideas over time, mm. what um, she thinks validate has already been validated, what she thinks hasn't been validated about yes. the market so far, etc. So we're not trying to qualify the market. We're trying to qualify the founder through our, through, uh, through our common know-how about the market okay. because okay. of the research that we did. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a, a huge amount of due diligence uh, per deal. It's due diligence on a founder level. Yeah. So it's not, like, it's not like legal due diligence where you take every single paperwork, every single documentation of the company, yes. make sure you know about it inside out, or financial due diligence, you know everything about the company inside out. Mm. We don't have any of that. These are basically companies that were formed over the past, I don't know, six months. Mm-hmm. So the only due diligence that you can do is about the founder. We try to talk about childhood traumas, wow. talk about why they're building this business, what's their main passion, yes. is it... Is it, is it, is it ego driven is it money driven can be anything but we try to map those as well and when i said that the discussions around the founder mm. is much more subjective this is where it gets really really subjective as to yeah. when, when, when we start discussing me and Aaron about what the main passion or what the main trigger of that founder is and whether that's a that's a sustainable um trigger or whether that would you know dissipate over time for example it is very subjective yes. you can argue both sides indeed indeed shivers so look um the, my next question is going to be about chat gpt and now i, I don't think you're going to use chat gpt to you know assess founders uh, from a subjective manner but in terms of some of the the red flag mm-hmm. um uh and market research pieces what role do you see chat gpt um having uh, in the VC world? A lot, actually. So um, the only mode that you have as a VC mm. is branding. Yes. That's it. There's nothing else. There are no network effects. There's no economies of scale. In fact, the more capital you have, the worse returns you have. Mm. There's an inverse correlation there. So the only real mode is brand. Okay. And that also goes on a personal level. The only mode that you have as a venture capitalist, no matter what your title is, yes. is the personal branding that you build over time. Mm. And to have that on top of the mind of the whole team, we wanted our team to, before having the first meeting of the founder, Mm. don't just look at their pitch deck, do a brief like a 10, 15 minute industry overview, look at the competitors, see when they were started, try to understand how much they raised, have they stagnated, are they going, is this this a mature industry? Mm. Is this a newly happening blue ocean industry, et cetera? So that when you do that first meeting, how much you already know sometimes really amazes the founder and then that feeds into your brand. A, it makes the meeting more productive, obviously, yes. but B, it also feeds to your personal branding yeah. um, as an analyst, for an example. 
Um, and now ChatGPT obviously accelerated that. Indeed. Now in 15 minutes, you can do research that's probably two hours yeah. normally. And I, I, I do that always, of course. I, before a meeting, I do a 15-minute chat with ChatGPT. Yes. How it Im- impacted us even more is um, all these 20, 30-page long deep dives that the team is doing um, after we had the second meeting, we're probably taking them hours and hours to do, like Indeed. Know, 20, 30 hours to do. But now for the past like couple of weeks, I can get more out of ChatGPT in 15 minutes than I can get reading that 20 page long document for half an hour, yes. which increases the bar for their work, you know? Indeed. It's either that ChatGPT is gonna take over your work mm. and um, you probably are not gonna do deep dives anymore, but you have to fill that gap elsewhere and then that kind of creates a new problem for you. Mm-hmm. Or you have to increase the bar so high that chat GPT's answers doesn't su- surface, basically. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and uh, look, I mean, I think it's a win-win for the team. Either way, you know, you're either going to get more deals uh, analyzed or you're going to be able to go down to a more granular level because, let's say, a lot of the legwork is now being done by, by the uh, uh, chat GPT. <laughs> Competition is great, especially if you're competing with innovation. Yes, that's, yes, that's, indeed. It's a tough competition to win over, so you have to be more creative. And you have to um, double down on your um, human aspects, mm. which is the only thing you have, and then build something proprietary for yourself. Another thing that we um, spoke with the team is that you ha- you can't become a partner in a fund just mm. because you're sophisticated, hardworking, diligent, blah, 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 doesn't make you a partner. Yes. You have to become proprietary. Mm -hmm. either proprietary from a deal flow perspective, proprietary from a fundraising perspective, doesn't matter. But the moment you're taken out of the equation, the whole company should collapse, basically, yes, yes. is when you become indispensable. Yes. Um, and now ChatGPT, so deep dives are obviously not wh- where a person becomes indispensable. Indeed. That's where actually it's easy to replace someone with someone else because there's a lot of smart people out there who can do good deep dives and research. Yes. Uh, so now they can put their efforts on places where it would make them proprietary and indispensable. Indeed. So far, Ines, we've covered a lot from sort of the deal flow, um, how you evaluate founders uh, and what drives them. Um, the the sort of um, research um, and reports that you prepare when you're evaluating um, a potential founder as well. Um, what shortcomings do you most often see with entrepreneurs? Um, I'd rather answer this in a way where I give the shortcomings of the 0.1% of the entrepreneurs because when you look at the general entrepreneurial um, population or the top of the funnel of 10,000 companies, yeah, a lot of shortcomings which I don't think are the things that we should focus on. We should focus on the shortcomings of the best of the best indeed, people indeed. out there. Um, technically, there are no shortcomings. In fact, there's an advantage here. Um, it's not that the cost of talent is cheaper in Turkey, because mm-hmm. cost of talent is cheaper in 200 countries around the world. It's cheaper in Nigeria, cheaper in Bangladesh, etc. Yes. It's more so that you don't have that much talent that was accustomed to doing business to the US in mm-hmm. other emerging markets, whereas you do in Eastern Europe and Turkey. So it becomes an access to talent and a talent retention advantage. Okay. Um, and I don't think we have any shortcomings there, either on a founder level or on a team level. I think technically we're, we're pretty good. Yes. Um, the biggest sh- shortcoming I think is more on a cultural level. Mm-hmm. Um, starts with language, um, obviously, but then also because we're really, really um, US focused, yes. you have to Americanize the whole company from a culture perspective. And that, that, that becomes a bottleneck because this is not the culture that you're used to, yes. um, either as a founder or the employees in the company. And the reason why I'm, I've been saying US mm. uh, from the start of the podcast is when you're betting on um, the local talent to build global success stories, it's mm. very tough to bet on these being B2C success stories. Indeed. It's much easier to bet on B2B because of two things. A, B2C is much more winner, winner takes it all uh, market dynamics and you have to make sure you, you raise the largest sum of capital. Yes. And obviously being based in Romania, Turkey, Poland, that's not your advantage, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that, that, that's reason number one. And reason number two is B2B is much more fragmented where you have multiple winners in every single vertical and yes. you can become one of that. So our portfolio is 80, 90% B2B. Fantastic. And the rest are gaming companies. <laughs> um, so in this, in this B2B um, worldview, more than half of the whole enterprise software spending happens in the US. Yes. Put another way, US enterprise software spending is larger than the rest of the world combined. Wow. And that's why you, uh, all, all the early adapters are in the US, um, all the large, large enterprise budgets are in the US. And if yes. you're trying to create a company in the blue ocean market, you have to be born in the US. You cannot um, get your first customers here in Turkey, find product market fit, and then scale to the US. It mm. doesn't work that way. Different market dynamics. Okay. Um, in fact, I believe that um, 
you can only go down the pyramid, not up the pyramid from a market, from a technology maturity perspective. Yes. After being successful in Turkey, you can only go to uh, markets that have similar dynamics. You can expand into Poland, Egypt, Dubai. Sure, yes. you can do that. But you cannot try to go to a much more mature technology market because then you would be losing all of your validations for the product market fit that you've created Indeed. over time. So the biggest problem becomes this Americanization aspect of the company, yeah. starting with the language of the company, also being able to hire elsewhere because compared to the US competitor that they have, yes. these companies have to go to a multi-office structure early on. Yeah. So in the second year, they have a San Francisco office. The founder may be moved there or New York office. So yes. that brings its own challenges that are not challenges that the competition is feeling because they're already based in whatever New York, San Francisco, wherever they may be. Mm. Um, so to Americanize the company early on, we try to shift the language. We yes. want to make sure they also hire internationally. So although there's great marketing talent, there can be, I, mean, I don't think there is, but there can be great <laughs> marketing or sales talent in Turkey. We still push them to hire in the U.S. so that the weight of the company is not like there's one founder in the U.S. and the rest of the team here in Turkey. Indeed. The founder should also be hiring like a chief of staff, a marketing person, a salesperson to be U.S. native yes. so that the company yes. gets, gets Americanized. We try to get American um, U.S. angels on board. Mm -hmm. Again, helps with the um, perception of the company being more American. And then down the line, as we do that value chain drift, drifting from the Turkish VC value chain to the U.S. VC value chain, yeah. the post-seed Series A rounds should be led by U.S. VCs. Yes. So I think that's the biggest shortcoming. The whole Americanization story mm. and how that's going to happen brings its own challenges to the company Yes. that the competition is not feeling because they're American from the start. Yeah, fantastic. Look, that's something I'd never heard of before, uh, and it, it's absolutely fascinating. That, yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think it's something that the Israelis have figured it out already. Mm. A long time ago yes they've been building companies copy and paste with that model yeah um i think estonia kind of caught up but those are like almost the two countries who are like um employing that model yes uh, for yeah. a while now far out and look I, I must admit b2b is my passion uh, uh so the point you made earlier in terms of us SaaS spend being more than the rest of the world combined and b2b being fragmented i think you know you get stickier um, uh, sort of contracts and higher value contracts as well. So Especially if you're in hear. blue ocean markets because the moment you're in a blue ocean market and by the way, I think 60-70% of our portfolio um, is blue ocean, only 30-40% are red ocean markets. Okay. The biggest risk on these blue ocean markets is obviously the market doesn't exist. Yeah. So you cannot find the market size. The you have a, you're taking a big market risk. Mm. The market may never happen. Yes. But at the same time, you're not taking a competition risk because it's too blue ocean of a market. You don't have real competitors to compete with. Yes. And that's where 60-70% of our um, deal making happens. And when you're in a blue ocean market, you need very good early adapters that are not going to push you to mediocrity. They're yes. just going to uplift you. And Indeed. unfortunately, those early adapters are uh, mostly, mostly um, in the U.S. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And look, I mean, you know, if you're able to solve the problems, uh, uh, then, you know, you get traction and, uh, and that leads to more revenue and, and higher valuations later on. So it makes sense for them to be in the U.S. Exactly, exactly. And one last thing about this, then I'm going to close this whole blue ocean resolution no bullshit. But um, and as, as a VC fund, when I compare ourselves to a US VC fund with a similar strategy, for example, doing in the US, mm. one core advantage that we have is that a US VC should be investing into the right team, right product, right timing. Timing mm -hmm. is very critical. So if a VC wants to do more blue ocean type of investments, yes. they want to make sure they don't invest too early because to sustain in the market would take millions and millions of dollars and you don't have the bandwidth to sustain in the market for five years yes. until the market comes mature enough so that you get your first customers. Whereas we can, mm -hmm. because of the um, because of the access to talent and then retention of talent and then the lower cost of talent, our yes. companies are able to sustain in the market for three, four, five years. Mm. So we shouldn't, as a VC fund, we shouldn't be scared of investing a bit too early. Yes. So we're not trying to gauge whether this is the right timing. We just want to make sure we're not too late. Okay. As long as we're not too too late, fair game. That's our competitive advantage because our companies are going to be able to sustain. And the, when the right timing comes, we'll be very well positioned, basically, yes. being in the market for a couple of years. That's excellent. I, it's a great way to ensure that, you know, you are diversified. Just make sure that you get in. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. And this, look, thanks so much for explaining that to us. Um, final question, I suppose, from my side uh, is... What are the key takeaways that you would provide to founders and maybe even VCs? Hmm. 
for founders, I think um, your early adapters define your company, define who you are. Yes. And I think picking your early adapters are as important as picking your co-founders. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of the founders are focusing on that. Instead, they're trying to get the lower hanging fruits, yes. which in return might be pushing them to either um, getting their first traction within their closed circle or in their own ecosystem, okay. again, pushing towards more red ocean, more mediocrity. Although yeah. they have this very vertical domain expertise and experience in one area that's up and coming, mm. a year, two years later, they end up in a position where they they are building traction because they went to mediocrity and are now servicing not a big early adapter population, but rather laggards in their own ecosystem. I think that's like something okay. that they should shy away from. The lower hanging fruits are not the best tasting fruits, but tasting fruits basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for VC funds, I think VC is a very much um, outlier return um, asset class. And that, that's been our thesis from the start, go big or go home. We're trying to invest into companies who can give us 50x more on our first ticket, basically, and we try yes. to do nothing else. And um, with an American approach, um, from a portfolio perspective, that's how you should build your portfolio. So any company that can give you 3 to 5x, yes. um, there's a big liquidity crunch in the market. M&As are a big problem in a lot of the emerging markets, etc. So although you're doing paper gains, actually to turn them into... Um, something you can eat yes. is cumbersome. Indeed, indeed. Excellent. Ennis, thank you so much uh, uh, for, for talking with us today and taking us through 500 Emerging Europe's story, uh, your own story, and um, talking us through the sort of deal process and giving some really key takeaways to founders and VCs. Well, thanks for having me. This was great. You're most welcome. Teşekkür ederiz. Teşekkür ederim. <laughs>